Okay, thank you for uh, settling down. Uh, so uh, this session is being chaired by Professor Jagdeep Choker, who's a founder member, trustee of ADR, and uh, he is a PhD from uh, Louisiana University in USA, former director in charge of the IIM Ahmedabad, and he had also worked in the Indian Railways earlier. So um, I think he is pretty well known to all of Varma. you. So we will start with the session. I'll hand over to him. Let's when a general says you stick to time, there's no choice. So I will be, uh, there are two professors on both my sides. And it's very difficult to control professors. Normally, once they start speaking, they stop after 55 minutes in the university system. But I will be impolite to all four of you gentlemen. Uh, not more than 10 minutes by the clock. And I will enforce it rather, uh, as uh, Dr. Zaidi will say, ruthlessly. So electoral bonds is something that I don't need to say anything about. I am sure everybody here knows about electoral bonds. Uh, and we will go by the order in which the speakers are listed. Uh, Professor Rajiv Gauda is a, a former member of the Rajya Sabha from the Congress Party. He has been a professor at the IIM Bangalore. And he has done a lot of work on political party financing and election financing. And I will request him to share his views on electoral bonds. He and I have been together on several such occasions. So, Professor Gowda, please. Good afternoon. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Chokar. And um, it's a pleasure to be interacting with the ADR community. Now, <coughs> I was one of the first people to encounter electoral bonds because I was sitting in the Rajya Sabha when Mr. Jaitley as part of the budget speech, uh, mentioned that he was introducing a measure to improve transparency in electoral funding. And like many others have also commented, this excited all of us who heard those words. And then, of course, we discovered that he meant the exact opposite in terms of what was actually coming out in the form of electoral bonds. So uh, you know, during that debate around the budget, I sort of jumped up and said, "This is, uh, you know, this is this is not a positive measure. This is something that increases opacity. You know, people are not able to follow the money. We won't know who is giving money to whom and what they're getting in return. This is one of the aspects of transparency that's very important in um, in, in a functioning democracy. And um, <coughs> anyway, so Mr. J, uh, so that was uh, one of my points, and then I also pointed out." that um, this whole argument that since the money was coming in through checks in, uh, through the banking system, that this meant that this was white money um, and not some other laundered money. I, I argued that um, you know, we saw during demonetization that enough black money got converted to white through the banking system. right? So don't tell me that this is somehow clean money coming in. Well, people are creative. India is uh, immensely creative when it comes to these sorts of issues, and uh, that will also be a problem. And then, of course, the other argument I had against uh, electoral bonds was I said that these are being issued by the State Bank of India, and, um, and therefore, since the State Bank of India is broadly under the central government, um, that the government with a nudge and a wink should be able to find out who contributed to whom. So this would negate the point that Mr. Jaitley came up with, which, you know, which is something that uh, my co-author Sridharan and I had uh, you know, written about. When we had interviewed a lot of politicians in earlier years, we have an, um, an, a paper called Reforming India's Party Financing and Election Expenditure Laws in something called Ele Election Law Journal in 2012. And during, that, um, uh, you know, during those interviews, People expressed their concerns. People who used to donate to political parties expressed their concerns that uh, if they backed the wrong party, then and the other other side won, that they would there would be a certain set of vindictive acts against them. Their contracts would be cancelled. Their um, uh, you know, th or like in current day, the ED would go after them or whatever happens. Uh, you know that sort of a situation. And so Mr. Jaitley held on to that aspect that people were concerned about 
vindictive retaliation um, and said we must go for anonymity. And then he also added to me, um, you, you know, th this is in the larger context of something else, I think. But he said, um, have you spoken to your leaders? I think they are with me, he said. <laughs> and, uh, that was, uh, I obviously, this gave us a surprise. So I had certainly not spoken to my leaders. But before coming here and also during our Raipur uh, session, plenary session, we um, did really come to the conclusion that the Congress party is opposed to the electoral bond scheme for basically the points that we have raised. Now, so far, what I'm saying you know, matches with the general sentiment of the room. But let me say one thing in favor of this proposal, which I, I, mean, which I actually have written about in a very, very uh, critical manner. What is this? This is one of a class of efforts to clean up political funding, to bring in, you know, if, if you listen to Mr. Jaitley, to bring in white money into the system, et cetera. And so this is really um, the larger problem that the nation faces. When Thirochan Shastri says or uh, uh, that the number of criminals has increased, the um, uh, expenditures for elections have increased, et cetera, it is because we have not, as a nation, properly confronted this issue that democracy, keeping democracy alive, costs a tremendous amount of money. It costs a lot of money to be a politician, right? To be an active politician is like a full-time job. And, uh, you know, when we think back to people from the freedom movement, a lot of the big leaders were um, uh, successful lawyers and, and had resources that gave them some bandwidth to do things, or they were well-to-do landowners who had the uh, surplus to be able to engage in politics. And today, it's a full-time occupation. And where is, uh, you know, do we provide them anything uh, to be active in the political sphere? No, we don't, right? And it costs, of course, a lot of money to run a political party, to run political campaigns, etc. And I'm not talking about illegal inducements or bribes or anything like that. I'm just talking about basic expenses. There is one loophole in the expenditure law which says political parties can spend as much as they want, but candidates cannot. Right? There's a 70 lakh limit on how much you can spend in a, uh, in a Lok Sabha election. Now, so, you know, people typically spend 10 times that minimally in most states in India. Now, if you're going to spend not 70 lakhs, but 7 crores, or in Karnataka and Maharashtra, probably multiples of that, where is that money coming from? And if you are able to tell me that it's coming from all of us who want cleaner politics, uh, I, I, anyone here has contributed to a political party candidate campaign ever? I can see a couple of uh, hands, maybe three. Okay. So basically, what happens is that we all want a cleaner system, but at, uh, you know, so we are sort of conflicted. At one level, we say we want to keep expenditures down, and we want to make uh, the field level for even a poorer candidate to be able to contest, and so we will bring in these election limits. But what those limits do is actually, they're unrealistic limits. I've even moved a, a private member bill that did not uh, obviously pass in Parliament about uh, getting rid of expenditure limits. They said, let it all come out and let people see who is doing what. And, uh, and then I was accused of trying to support corruption or something like that. But nonetheless, the point is that we have to face this central fact of democracy, right? That we need clean money in the system, and we need to spend realistic amounts. And I would say that the election commission at election time goes after overt expenditures rather than covert expenditures. Because what it does, this limit, is it favors people with black money and the networks to, to, to distribute that black money. You know, if you gave me a lot of black money today, I wouldn't know what to do with it. Maybe I would. But the point is, I'm learning <laughs> after so many years. But the point is, no, no, I am not actually. But the point is that these issues are, where, you know, so what we've done is we've created a system which um, favors the tainted and screws the sainted. You want to be a clean politician, you cannot survive in today's politics. That is what has happened, right? Unless you are part of a, a party which is winning on some uh, Vishwaguru's wave or something like that, it's, you know, every one of us has to spend a huge amount on just keeping the campaign running.
So now, how do we change this? That's the real point, right? So some of us have uh, argued, uh, Varun Santosh and I have written multiple times, that just like all of us want national defense, but none of us would voluntarily contribute, this uh, clean polity is a public good, and if we all want it, we should have public funding of elections. That will change the game. We need to come out with rules and criteria whereby uh, both candidates and parties can legally raise resources, and this should come out of our tax contributions. This will at least allow people to have the minimum threshold level of expenditure resources to be able to mount a credible campaign. Otherwise, Everything that exists today, including social media and email and everything that's supposed to be free, is still going to the people who can fund one massive social media campaign. So the, every new technology that comes in, instead of leveling the playing field, worsens the imbalance. And uh, so this is my argument that let's, okay, you can criticize election bond, electoral bonds as much as you want. We are opposed to it. Uh, partly because the results show you that 90% or, uh, seven, uh, say, or more than two-thirds go to the BJP and very little to the rest. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, so basically, let's figure out how we are going to take um, and create the rules for uh, distributing resources. Is it on the basis of match, matching funding to people who go out there and get support uh, and people's uh, smaller contributions, things like that. So these are all nuances that we need to work out. But until we figure out how to deal with electoral funding in a clean, uh, legal manner, we will not just be the world's largest democracy, we will be the world's largest hypocrisy. Thank you. Uh, like. Professor Shukla has a long and distinguished career in, as an yes, economist in the government and in the academia. At the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Ranade uh, and ADF for giving me this opportunity. I have been writing about uh, the electoral bond scheme for quite some time. Um, let me start by saying that uh, you know this is one scheme, despite what Mr. Rajiv uh, Gowda mentioned. Uh, there is a completely diametrical opposite viewpoint between the political party and the civil society organization. In fact, uh, contrary to what all of us have been saying about uh, BJP getting the maximum share, uh, in the West Bengal election, TMC uh, was the largest beneficiary. And in the recent election in Karnataka, there was a large spot, about eight times increase over 2014, and one doesn't know uh, who was the beneficiary, but it looks like that if there is a political wave in favor of certain political party, uh, they could be beneficiary of the electoral bonds. So it could be could uh, need not be linked to the uh, majority party. It could be linked to a party which uh, the people perceive has the better chance of getting an election. So, so, uh, so having said that, uh, all of us know about uh, the the the. Uh, evolution of uh, the electoral bond scheme. Uh, next one, um, bond scheme. Uh, so, as Mr. Goda mentioned, it's uh, supposed to uh, clean the political system, but um, it has a certain periodicity and all. But uh, as we see, next one, as we see that um, uh, this is particularly a scheme. I have been studying as a constitutional lawyer uh, this particular scheme, and I find that the number of amendments which have been made uh, in the Finance Act of 2017 has been the maximum. You know, um, whether uh, it was an amendment to the IT Act, to the Representation of People Act, to the Company Act. So, so the, the acts have been rather humongous. And the most disquieting aspect of these amendments are that A, you don't report to the income tax authorities, you don't report to the election commission, there is no uh, limit to uh, the amount that you can contribute. And so therefore, uh, this is uh, some kind of a legalization of unaccounted for money without limit and without reporting to the uh, existing system. I don't think uh, there has been any bill which has this kind of a ramification. Uh, the other point which I would like to mention is that, uh, you know, like the Aadhaar bill, which was challenged uh, in the Supreme Court, where uh, the present Chief Justice had mentioned that it was a fraud on the Constitution. So, so this is something which is also very important. I think we must keep in mind.
that um, uh, this particular bill being uh, you know uh, peddled as a money bill uh, under article 110 really doesn't caught muster you know by any account you know if you read uh, article 110 uh, the subsections very clearly say this is for taxation this is for borrowing this is for spending out of the consolidated fund of india the last section 110 e it says anything linked to the above you know it doesn't say not anything you know it says very clearly that it must be concerned with the consolidated fund of india or the uh, from the public fund account so therefore or the contingency fund so therefore therefore this is some aspect which uh, which also needs to be uh, needs to be mentioned now one of the points one of the points which uh, i like to emphasize here that uh, the question that we have a right to know the right of informed voting you know is not explicitly mentioned in the constitution if you see article 191a there is no mention either that the freedom of speech and expression of press is absolute or it says that there is a right to informed voting so this is a second generation right you know like like uh, right to life in article 21 the supreme court has given a number of amplification that even right to have clean water clean air or even uh, you know um, right to live livelihood or even right to education you know all these things so these are all amplification by the supreme court uh, so therefore therefore the judgments on the basis of which adr has really moved the supreme court are a consequence of number of judgments given by the Supreme Court that yes, Article 191A, freedom of speech and expression, is just not limited to freedom of speech and expression. It also is a right to informed voting. So that's very important. And of course, it would be subject to restriction, reasonable restriction, which is there in Article 192. Uh, but that would be also subject to judicial review. So therefore, therefore, there is no clear constitutional provision on this but it is essentially a transparent democracy civil society that we are looking for which is basically going to take it forward now i'd like to mention in passing two three things that you know despite the kind of optimism that is being shown um, i was uh, witness to the uh, case one on the bharati case about 50 years back i was uh, i was a young graduate when my brother took me to the supreme court and I could uh, listen to Nani Palkiwala uh, expounding on uh, the basic structure uh, concept before a full bench, 13 bench. He was essentially referring to the importance of democracy. And he, I distinctly remember, um, he mentioned about free and fair elections. So therefore, therefore, though the judges haven't really mentioned, there is not a uh, fixed menu of basic structure. But I remember Justice Salat mentioned that yes, free and fair elections should be uh, should be a basic structure. Uh, the second thing I'd like to mention that despite uh, you know the sanguineness that we have about democracy, uh, Ruchi Sharma in a recent article very rightly mentioned. Uh, he has studied several countries and he finds that the youth seem to be disillusioned with the democracy. So there is a tendency that the youth is more with, uh, there is a sense of impatience, there is a sense of, you know, aligning with a right-wing ideology. Uh, so that is something which is, which is very, very, very disturbing. The third thing I would like to mention is that we need to make a distinction between economic integration and cultural homogenization. You know, that's very, very important. Having GST, one lesson, one tax is a beneficial thing. But if you think that India should be homogenized culturally, religiously, I think we are getting into a very, very dangerous space. So that's, that's I think, it's a very, very uh, difficult thing. The fourth thing I would like to mention that as an economist, you know, I have seen uh, the country moving over from socialism to, to market economy. But there is a sense that we are also getting into market fundamentalism, you know, where we are also clearly promoting crony capitalism. So along with market fundamentalism, I do find that a religious fundamentalism is bringing up in this country, which I find to be a very, very disturbing trend. So therefore, in conclusion, I would like to mention 
that uh, that while the ADR, the many many of the civil society organizations mm -hmm. have been doing uh, a very very pioneering job on this, we have to take note of these disturbing trends. So uh, Dr. Ranade mentioned about uh, evening coming into twilight. I would say I was more um, you know I remembered. Sudhir Mishra, Ek Raat Ki Kab Subha Hogi, you know, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, being a student of literature also, uh, I would uh, be more guided by Mark Ibsen, Ibsen in The Enemy of People, which was made into a film by Satyajit Ray Ganasatru. He is an incorrigible optimist. At the end of the tunnel, uh, Ibsen believes there is light. And I'm very, very happy in this wonderful forum. You have ADR, you have Gokhale Institute, the great um, um, Gokhale, you know, uh, the Brendan Theory. And um, I um, had the good fortune of uh, meeting uh, Professor Dandekar for his poverty line. So in this most wonderful environment, let us take this forward. But at the same time, let us keep all this uh, you know, insidious signals in mind because unless we are aware of this insidious uh, signal, insidious, invidious signals, uh, we are the democracy at be at can be at a serious crossroad. Thank you, friends. Next, I would request Mr. Nitin Sethi, uh, who is with the Reporters Collective, and I must say in his introduction that the kind of reporting he has done on electoral bonds on the basis of right to information work done by Venkatesh Nayak, Kavado Batra, Anjali Bharadwaj. But the reportage by Nitin and his colleagues, which came first in the Affected Post, if I'm not mistaken, has been sensational. And I, for one, really look forward to listening to you. Absolutely. <laughs> it should. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's odd to be amongst academics and people who do serious work as a journalist. Uh, our job is the most frivolous, and it's got more frivolous over days, uh, as we all know. Long before I got into what, you know, we all journalists are supposed to brand themselves as something because that's how you seek donations. You say you do better than the other. So we started, began to calling ourselves investigative journalists, as uh, Mr. Kocher was calling us pretty late in life. But very early when I got into journalism and uh, had these initial inklings and stories we'd heard about what journalism did, one of the things was that we were told that it's supposed to hold the powerful accountable to society. And we got into it by naivety. And I remember very early on, I caught a prominent minister at that time in the UPA government, which, which I thought in my early days of my career was a pretty good story to do. I caught him you know, uh, with a little corruption of around six or seven crores. <laughs> and, uh, and this was naivety, yes, you can laugh at it. Uh, I took it to my editor. My editor very quickly called up the minister to inform him that the story will not go, but he should know. Uh, the minister's PS called me very quickly and said, please come over to the office. And I went over to the office and he smiled and he offered me tea, coffee, etc. and said, this would be rather shameful for the minister. Look at the size of his cabinet and look at the size of his ministry. I'll offer you 150 crore worth corruption story to carry. At least the minister would not feel ashamed. That minister um, at that time is still a powerful entity in the Maharashtrian politics, and that's why I remembered him. And that was us coming to terms with our abilities as journalists, as watchdogs, or at least uh, claim to watchdogs of what we are able to do. And then long years after when electoral bonds happened, I still remember I used to work in a business paper where the moment it appeared and uh, Mr. Jaitley spoke about it, I think by any sheer logic it was evident that this is uh, abetting corruption. And it was doing several other things, but clearly it was abetting corruption in a fashion that had not been done before. Not that, again, I think we all must remember and we know there has been enough cash flow in the system for generations in the way the elections are run. But this was, as uh, previous speakers had said, it was creating a separate channel of banked, unaccounted money with uh, no limits and no ability to judge the real source of that uh, money being generated. And my editors looked at me and said, but anything that the government does is good. And uh, I quickly lost the job at that organization, worked out, and was able to produce this work. The two th or three things to me struck out then and strike out today about, um, besides the details of this uh, entire episode of what the bonds do, 
how they process and many speakers have talked about how they allow foreign entities, domestic entities, unknown entities to channel money quietly through accounts which can run through shell companies. In my previous avatar, I used to be a chartered accountant, so I've actually witnessed how the shell companies are created uh, to funnel money which is unaccounted black and yet is moving through bank accounts steadily. And we noticed the first trend of this in the first rounds of uh, when the uh, details were coming out under RTI, largely due to other RTI activists, I was just dreaming on it. But I think one thing that struck me then and strikes me now about this was uh, while we aren't able to do it with the cash in the economy that goes into election naming, there is large sums. I have my relatives who are politicians. Obviously, as professional, I've watched politics at closed doors. And you know the volume of money that moves around around elections. You'll actually see a GDP bump sometimes, fair amounts around general elections because a huge amount of cash has floated in the economy at that time or got unlocked. The fact that you're now legitimizing corporates and large entities to move money through bank accounts to parties also in some ways is the first step towards where you l remove the tag of shame of corruption being done at that scale. You, it's also the first step towards where if you imagine your reforms and most I think Zaidi and others have spoken about the reform they had sought which would be to reduce the impact of money and make it either more transparent and at the same time, a second channel, reduce the amount of money that goes or at least gets acknowledged about that's being used. You're now moving through an era where you can actually say there's a legitimate law legal system that says corporates can provide money to politicians to carry out their business. And as would be very fair to imagine, any company that is investing in a politician, and this is a high risk game as previous speakers, I think in the last panel suggested, the returns on that investment need to be high. And clearly anyone who gets elected with that resources is, is going to return, pay the return to the investor and not to the citizens. We in the last six months have heard conversations in political corridors of taking the next step forward from electoral bonds where you actually move towards more a US style funding from corporates and even this becomes redundant in the next five, seven years. And those conversations at least to our years over the last year have only expanded. Again, we move far away from the fact that we will not be able to do away with cash in the system that goes into elections, but we'll also move towards a regime where there's a social, moral, and legal sanction for corporates to provide large sums to our politicians to win elections. And to me, while the constitutional and legal debates can go on, I think once that rubric is crossed where the shame is over about it, we would have moved into a substantively different kind of politics. I'll come to the second part and perhaps I'll close faster than you wish me to. Uh, the other part to consider, and I've always thought about this while the work is great and the journalism we produced around electoral bonds, we continue to produce for the last, I think, three years work on electoral bonds. There's some more work we'll produce next month. Still, if you look at the quantum of money going into electoral bonds, it's not such a big deal. It's fairly small compared to the overall kitty that's required to run elections. If I'm not mistaken, it's somewhere to the tune of 16, 17,000 at the moment. Average general elections would be 50 to 70,000. I mean, I know my relatives who spent 10 crores, 12 crores in a simple ML election. So clearly, by ballpark figures, this is nothing compared to the large mm -hmm. city. Therefore, the question to my mind would be, why would anyone want to be so insistent in keeping this alive? Why is it such a significant issue when the volume is not so significant for a government? And that to me, I think, is more important to study than just who gets the money. To me, we go back to the same thing, and this is our understanding, that this is money that is coming from a bank account. Therefore, it can be paid in circumstances where political parties have to make payments where there is no option but to make it as a bank transfer. Now, where is bank transfers for political parties almost essential survival that they have no other option they cannot provide cash and there's very few occasions where a po political party really has to do that fortunately now once when it books helicopters in its own names otherwise normally it's the corporates which are booking but if you book them you need to because the sums are so large you have to do it through 
banking channels the other is social media investments all payments to social media and any platform of advertising which is partly in india but is perhaps based outside or has a headquarters outside essentially asks you to give money in checks or in online transfers unless obviously you created a con set of conduits around you who you fund money to and they from cash move it into bank accounts and then transfer to the uh, main parties to the social platforms and we also track for some parties the investment they made on social media platforms over the last 4 5 years we've also looked at the impact that this had and the relationship the political party say bjp in this case had with facebook with reliance and how cross funding happened to promote a certain party in a certain polarization the fascinating bit to me and i this is more a suggestion a request because adr does such fascinating work to also expand look into the area of digital dominance in elections and its influence on uh, elections because the financing digital space and elections are all kind of coming together now is for every rupee spent through this digital channel um, any political party can reach far more people than it can through any other medium the cost per reach is much much cheaper uh, the impact perhaps is less but the level to which political parties are able to hide how they spend where they spend and how much how well they can micro target audiences is tremendous and to that effect the electoral bond money makes complete sense for any political party to have and across board it's not only the party in power obviously it has a great advantage and i think the previous speaker was right that if uh, corporates find it in their good sense they believe another political party in the province or a state might uh, be the winning horse it will bet on it and give it more and we've seen this previously in odisha and other states where uh, donations from that particular state end up going to the party in power which is relatively considered as a good dominant force i'll end with uh, suggesting perhaps uh, to look at the larger themes that the conference was attending on corruption and criminality um you know the critique of it perhaps might lie and i think from states which are on india's peripheries Uh, sometimes outliers are outliers but sometimes outliers are good spaces to study to understand how the business operates uh, part of my life is spent in arunachal and manipur if you would understand the electoral politics and the funding of electoral politics in these two states where per capita I'm, i have firm belief the spending by candidates is much much higher in any part of this country the per capita spends on electoral cash is phenomenal in these areas and if you would understand how it operates more like a distributive economy of corruption rather than our vision of what elections is and how electoral politics work it might give us a little better sense of how to play this game in the rest of the country i think a standard battle of just saying that we will curtail and we'll monitor and we'll be able to weed out cash influence and the influence of power and violence out of electoral politics i think there many more people who tried harder and in fair positions it's unlikely till we understand the political economy that keeps this alive and there are other drivers i think besides just good elections if you can have elections in states where people actually do not think these elections provide them democratic values but just survival spaces and yet they're able to invest more than 20000 30000 crores in an assembly election there are much other different kinds of uh, factors that are in play than i think just looking at it through a simplified lens of corruption as an evil and i'll stop here thank you thank you nitin uh, and the last of these distinguished panelists as professor shastri kept saying is dr vipul mudgal who is uh, the director of common cause but also a trustee of adr and i would like all of us to know that he got a phd in media studies from the university of leicester in the uk he is not a run of the mill journalist he is an academic of the highest order thank you sir uh, now this is definitely a privilege i am also among other things a petitioner in this case a double petitioner because being part of adr and common cause it's a common petition by these two organizations now i am standing in for kamini jaiswal ji who's a a uh, trustee of adr who's not here she was supposed to tell us 
what happened at the Supreme Court when this case went and why is this not coming up. Now, it's quite surprising that something which is in part going on since 2015, but actually 2017 comprehensively has not even got a proper hearing so far. You know, so I, so I thought I'll, I'll just take you through the provisions of this act once again, just to see how breathtaking is the level of questionability in this. You know, come to think of it, there has been a debate, uh, uh, ADR has been part of that debate for a long time that why should a corporate be interested in elections at all? Why should a corporate be allowed to participate in elections? If you are a politician, if you are a rich politician, you are Mr. Tata or you are Mr. Ambani or you are Mr. So and so, you have a lot of money you pay from your personal wealth. Your company is your company, but your money is your money. You pay that money to any political party of your choice. But why should a company pay to a political party? Now this is deal making. A company is paying to a political party, direct deal making. And in this deal making, two things have happened. Because there was a little bit of guilty conscience in this, the uh, it was thought that this is like, this is something questionable. So there should be a limit. So there was a limit. The limit was that you should be a company which is a profit making company and then you pay 7.5% maximum of the average profit of the last three years. Okay. Now that has gone, which means that there is, it has opened the floodgates of as much money. You are a 100 crore company and you pay 95 crores to a political party, no issues. So as Nitin was saying that the, the way the shell companies operate, you can actually form a shell company for the explicit purpose of fighting elections and pay most of its money and the company can go bust after that. It does not matter. You know, so uh, this limit, removing this limit is, is the limit because you are actually making it open for the corporates completely. Number two, you have allowed even loss making companies to do that. Now, this is very interesting. You are, you are making losses for the shareholders who bought the shares of your company and for the rest of the world. I mean, you are, a, you should be ashamed of yourself for, for whatever reason. You are a loss making company and you are making donation to political parties. Now, what is going on here? Again, I mean, this is double deal making that you are saying that, look, you bring me out of this mess and I pay you for this, you know. So I think this and this has all started with this electoral bond case in which, as was mentioned earlier, six, not one, but six amendments were done. First was the Finance Act 2017, Finance Act 2016, the Representation of People Act 1951, the Reserve Bank of India Act of 1934, the Income Tax Act of 1961 and the Companies Act. And we all know that this came as a money bill and that was the immediate provocation for ADR to file this case. That look, you did not have any discussion on this and you are, the other thing that you are doing is actually the dubious, absolutely dubious interest groups and corporate lobbyists are going to have complete sway of, of elections. And there was a little background to this and the background was that both main political parties of the country, Congress and the Bharati Janata Party were caught taking money from a foreign company. Now, the punishment for this was definitely deregistration and perhaps criminal cases. I mean, there is there is no other way. I mean, Chaukar Saab has been speaking on this on television quite a lot and with a lot of anger. I can't muster that much anger, but I can I can tell you that this one thing that you have opened the floodgates in such a way, you know, that there is absolutely no limit. There is no meaning of an individual's money. You give 5,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees to a political party, that has no meaning. because you can, And the other thing it does 
is that the deal making is done by one or two people at the central level in the party. So they used to be like a big river has small tributaries coming and making it a big river. So they were satraps in all political parties. They would get money to the political party and they would get a portion of the clout of that political party. And that is how the political party's power was divided. But today, if one or two individuals are doing all the deal making and they are getting all the money from just one or two companies, then there is there is no question of inner party democracy in that party at all. And that is happening to all political parties because of this kind of uh, uh, thing. The other thing that, I'm, and I'll also take you through the, uh, uh, the, the most important thing which I, uh, I missed was actually you have opened it for the foreign companies through their subsidiaries in India. Now, both political, uh, both Congress and BJP were caught taking money from a political party, from, from, a, from, from a foreign company, and they amended certain acts in retrospect, and they still made mistakes in that, and the Supreme Court just looked the other way. I mean, this is like completely inexplicable how they went about it and how both political parties were able to survive after taking money from, uh, uh, from foreign companies when it was not allowed. But today, it is allowed. So if you are a Dawood Ibrahim or if you are a foreign country, you, you, are, you are a China or a Pakistan or any country you imagine and you want to have a share in India's politics, you are most welcome because you can have some company, you can have an Indian subsidiary of some company and there is no dearth of shell companies in this world and you can come, you are invited, you can come on uh, walking on a red carpet and participate in India's elections. Now, we have seen that this has become possible. The debate was there in the US also that uh, Chinese companies and Russian companies were trying to affect the US elections where the firewalls are much higher. So, our country, where the roads are open, if you allow foreign companies and all the floodgates you have opened, that 7.5% percent you did before the profit-making company, you do 100% or 50% or 70% and then it doesn't mean anything to save the election. So after that, the 3-4 things that happened in the Supreme Court, I will tell you just a minute. First of all, it will be in 2 minutes. So, पहले तो नोटिस इशू हुआ ऑन अक्टूबर 3 2017 नोटिसेस वर इशूड टू द यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया टू से दैट व्हाई वाज दिस डन एंड देयर वाज लाइक देयर वाज सम अदर पिटिशनर्स आल्सो द आवर पिटिशन वाज टैग्ड विद देयर पिटिशन द नेक्स्ट थिंग हैपेंड वाज द लॉ मिनिस्ट्री एंड द इलेक्शन कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया आल्सो गिव देयर एफिडेविट्स बट इट्स इट इट मस्ट बी मार्क्ड दैट व्हाइल they had some divergent view, but they did not say that during the hearing. They just submitted whatever they needed to submit. And then later, of course, they all changed their position. Then again, in October 14, 2022, the court asked the government whether the electoral bond scheme revealed the source of money or not. And the government said it's absolutely transparent. There is no question. And I can, I, I, I can tell you what exactly they wrote. The methodology of receiving money is absolutely transparent. It is impossible to get any black or unaccounted money in it. Basically saying that this check is coming from the check or money transfer is coming from the money transfer. That's why there is no doubt about it. Like the first speakers said that in the demonetization time, we have seen how many you know, thousands of crore can fly in a matter of seconds. So after that, December 15, 2022, the matter was taken up again and every time uh, uh, ADR will have a meeting of its trustees, they would request Chonkar Saab ki sir kuch kariye, ye thoda to tez ho, ye to case aage hi nahi bardha. To kai sari applications dali gai, kai bar humare lawyer jo Prashant Dushan ji hai, unho ne kai bar orally mention kiya ki sir is case ko aage badhana hai, sir is, ko, is case ko aage badhana hai. Lekin uske baad ye case aake 2023 mein, जहां अटक गया है वो आप सबको पता है कि अब ये एक कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल बेंच के बारे में जा पास में जाएगा तो उसमें भी प्रशांत भूषण जी ने कहा 
कि यदि आप ये कर रहे हैं तो कृपया जल्दी कीजिए इसमें कोई तो टाइम लिमिट रखिए बीच में एक बार जहाँ जहाँ स्टेट में इलेक्शन हुए थे हर बार एक एप्लीकेशन ए की तरफ से लगाई गई कि देखिए अब ये त्रिपुरा में इलेक्शन हो रहे हैं अब तमिलनाडु में हो रहे हैं केरला में हो रहे हैं असम में हो रहे हैं वेस्ट बंगाल में हो रहे हैं कुछ करिए इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स फिर से खरीदे जाएंगे फिर से बेईमानी होगी अब इसको रोकिए लेकिन सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने उसमें कोई भी हमको रेमेडी या कोई कोई सहायता देने से पूरी तरह से इनकार कर दिया तो उसके बाद अब ये कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल कोर्ट अब डिसाइड करेगा कि क्या ये मैटर सचमुच अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल है या नहीं है मेरे हिसाब से कोर्ट के ऊपर ये सवाल पूछने का हमें पूरा हक है कि सर आपने ये इतना महत्वपूर्ण केस जो मेरे हिसाब से आज़ादी के बाद का सबसे रिग्रेसिव और सबसे खतरनाक डेमोक्रेसी के लिए सबसे ज़्यादा आत्मघाती अगर कोई कदम उठाया है तो वो ये एक कदम है तो हम सुप्रीम कोर्ट से पूछने का हमें पूरा अधिकार है कि सर ये केस क्यों नहीं लग रहा धन्यवाद